Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Mathias. I'm working with Ben at uh, Armo, uh, which is a security startup uh, specialized in Kubernetes uh, scanning and hardening. And yeah, today we will talk about SecComp. So I will. In I have like a few points to introduce what it is, and then. We are really doing this uh, unconference to get feedback from users, whether you know it, and if you know it, if you use it, and if not, trying to understand if it makes sense to implement uh, some capabilities into Cubescape or just if nobody cares. So, what is SecComp? So SecComp is uh, a feature of the Linux kernel since 2.16, something like this, so very old and um, it enables to block uh, syscalls from the user space to the kernel space. So you can also configure it to just uh, create warnings, but usually we want to block it. So why is it good to use SecComp? Well, you can protect your kernel from malicious apps because let's face it, the, the Linux kernel has like dozens of syscalls and few of them are, are used by everybody. And then there are like all those special management ones that are never used. And since they are never used, they have issues and people can abuse them. So usually it's a, it's a good idea to restrict them. And it's mostly harmless for most of the applications. So who learned about SecCom for the first time right now? Did everyone knew about it before? Okay, there are a few hands, so that's, that's good. So somewhere we have done something good that people learned SecCom for the first time today. So that's great. And uh, it's been one of the main things in terms of isolation for containers. Uh, so it's a really important topic. And uh, I hope we yeah, can learn it's a bit not more. only from containers. I mean, usually it's for regular processes. And, and containers are special cases of processes. Uh, so. Now, if, if I can circle back to Kubernetes, so SecComp has been available since 119, which means more than three years ago, it was August 2020, and we haven't seen that much of an adoption. Uh, so usually what, what you have available is like few built-in profiles that are available in Kubernetes, like mostly the default one, and uh, you can, or, or there is also the unrestricted one, which is not a profile. And when you create your, your pods, uh, yeah, you can apply these, these profiles to, to, the, to, the, to your application. But the, the default one is like way too general. So what is good is usually to write your own profile, but then you run into like problems of how do I take this configuration, which is a Linux configuration, into all my nodes? How do I like synchronize and distribute these profiles? And, and Kubernetes doesn't provide any mechanism for this. So maybe that's why people are not using it. But that's all I had for like an introduction. Now I would like to know if any of you is using SecComp in Kubernetes. Okay, you want to talk more? I can come over there, if possible, if not. Um, well, we're using it a little. I think it's the mandate now is you have to have the runtime default, but we're not making our own. And I don't even know how to make our own in our current environment. Okay. Are you using like a plain Kubernetes or like a special distribution like OpenShift or? Uh, EKS. Okay, on EKS. Great. Yeah, just to continue on that topic, I remember there was a feature added called uh, SecCom default, and by default it wasn't enabled in Kubernetes. So then there were three different profiles that were uh, created, which were sort of built in in some ways, and a runtime default was the default for the default SecCom feature, uh, and uh, that's been. Uh, available for the last few widgets for folks to use. I think you're, you're probably using one of that. 
Yeah. And uh, there are some, there is some very good Kubernetes documentation and some blogs uh, where uh, people have said, like, if you want to create your own SecCom profile, how you could do it. And uh, when would that be useful versus using runtime default? So that's something to maybe look at and consider later on. Any other questions or maybe why people haven't used SecCom? Okay, you, you have more to talk. So we've started to roll it out in small like places. The one where we're like nervous about is like how or guess how do we like know, you know we make this change and apps start failing or failing more than usual that the cause is like this change mostly because like not there's a lot of stuff going on in non prod and a lot of things are just broken by default so. It's hard to tell, like, is this my fault or is this somebody else's fault? Um, so what's kind of like the recommended way to check for that? So, yeah, good, good question. I, I don't think you can uh, start second in, uh, in just warning mode uh, by default in Kubernetes. I'm not sure about this. So that would be one solution, but... Um, what, what we had in mind, actually, uh, with Cubescape uh, is to put some instrumentation and uh, check and list all the syscalls that an application is doing during a normal workload uh, processing and, and then gather this list and help you uh, define profiles, help you distribute those profiles and then enable for the pod. So we wanted to make it like more in an automated way, but it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, I don't know if people are interested into this because how I see it, uh, it would be nice to, to have the, the probes deployed in development. You run all your tests in, uh, in development and then you generate profiles and you distribute profiles in your testing and production environment so that you're not mixing them and uh, yeah, that's how we want to do it. So the assumption here looks like is the dev is actually equivalent to production and whatever you learn is probably going to match with production. I don't know how much is it true for how many of us that development environment matches production. So that can be one of the challenges. I have one more question. Great, and, and I'm actually going to answer your question because um, we did a bunch of digging and research, looking at this, not specifically with Kubernetes workloads, but with more general Linux applications and you know using them to do things. And 99% of the time, roughly, you will stay within the common things you saw in your testing or your other environmental runs. But what that means is your application breaks all the time. Um, if you want to use it for logging or something like that, it's fairly useful, but um, there are enough corner cases related to weird stuff that happens in situations with timing, with some error handling case getting triggered, with other stuff like this that um, you'll, I think, very quickly run into problems. Or you'll be extra permissive, and if you're extra permissive, then you're not doing yourself a service. All right, I'll, I'll go to him first and then you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's the same with uh, network policies, right? When you, you write network policies, uh, you're based on like a default workload. Uh, and once you apply them, you don't know if you need to add more because you don't see when they are blocked because the, the traffic that doesn't exist, you don't see. And it's the same with syscalls. So yeah, actually, uh, there's no good answer for that. Yeah. 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 I think it's. Uh, I want to add on to that because I totally agree. Um, in the sense that, um, I think it has to do with the fact that it is it is a syscall level um, policy, and I think that like something like a network policy, I think is more easily kind of you can kind of understand what like network calls your um, partners try to make, but almost every app now is written in a high level language. Like very few people are writing C and directly calling Linux syscalls. Um, and like, for example, like I pulled up the container D like default runtime profile and you see like a ton of syscalls that are like allowed and then everything else is disallowed. 
for example, and like some of these, like you've never heard of them uh, because you know, like you said earlier, there's so many Linux syscalls out there. Uh, and I think just like the difficulty of working at the syscall level, like profiling is very difficult. Um, and you, you, um, like I said earlier, uh, you know, going through every case, like testing is a difficult problem, pro profiling is a difficult problem. And I think that's like one of the big things that's, that's just an issue with any syscall based system, uh, not just seccomp. So I think we have to figure out, like, I think just if, if there's a better way to profile things and just kind of be reasonably certain that it's not gonna break things in a weird way, more people will be willing to use it. Mm -hmm. I think very well made points. Uh, I'll come back to the gentleman at the back. This is really just more of a comment. So uh, for our, I, our given use case, we were looking at seccomp for runtime. And what we found is whenever that was turned up with policy, we just had unexpected application behavior. And our um, what we believed was happening is that underlying error handling that is not part of seccomp basically was in conflict with the unexpected behavior of not receiving a system call return. So, when, so just a recommendation for anyone who is looking at this is to start with observability first. Put it in, turn it on for logging, see what the environment is doing. Be cognizant of the error handling that occurs around whether it be, uh, well, just error handling in, in general because that is probably going to be the, one of the largest conflicts in, in reasons why your application has unexpected behavior. So once you have observability, then start to introduce policy in a step-by-step -step basis, whether it be, uh, you know, group it together by function or, or by, um, you know, related to how your application is working. Any other thoughts? Okay, I see one hand. So as much as like the narrow allow list is nicer for truly least privilege, the other option is like just denying known dangerous calls or limiting things like you haven't tested. Like, and I guess a, a related question there is, I'm actually kind of curious how consistent some of the default policies are, because I think there's some variance, like is IOU ring allowed in policies or not? It notoriously also isn't great compatible with SecCom. But some policies allow it and some don't, such as I think Docker, for example, disallows it, allows it in the default policy, but the Podman set does. I suspect that's used by Cryo also. I'd be curious, like, is there a consistency there? Are people using it to disable IO viewing out of caution, like Google is now? Yeah, and I think some environments. Anyone want to share experiences about IO Uring? Uh, I think it is probably worth to take a step back for folks new to SecComp, what runtime default is and how Kubernetes works with container runtimes and how are we inheriting the SecComp policies from the container runtimes. Anyone want to try and answer that? This, you can also answer, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I should know because <laughs> I'm working in a kubelet uh, most of my free time. Uh, yeah, don't know. Wait, wait. Yeah. Can you just yeah pass him the, the mic because it's recorded so. Yeah, so the, the two questions there is, I don't know, but are, are they consistent was, would be the first question, um, which is some risk to like, are you writing a generic open source app? You want to run on all runtimes, you have generic clusters, you want to you fit in the common defaults. So that would be like, I don't know, uh, is the ecosystem consistent? Because I know there's a, there is at least some variance in some of the runtimes. Uh, and then the separate question was, yeah, I'm just curious if people are using it. What, what kinds of syscalls are people frequently like, out of caution, disabling? I, I, can share, I can share some history that I know and folks in watching the recording or in the meeting room can correct me. Uh, from what I remember, 
Docker was one of the first container runtimes that became popular, and the seccom filters that they developed were tested across multiple containers in Docker Hub. And the idea was if those containers are not failing, there is a good chance that the default profile is good enough. And then eventually, as uh, Kubernetes became more and more popular, there were more container runtimes. Uh, container D, Cryo, and then there was a container runtime interface uh, that also was created. So today how Kubernetes kind of interacts with all of them is Kubernetes in itself, uh, when you say runtime default, it's going to identify the container runtime that we are using on the worker nodes. So for a, like a quick summary of Kubernetes architecture, very high level, uh, there is a component called kubelet uh, that works runs on every worker node. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like a local agent for Kubernetes uh, API server and all the schedulers and controllers. Kubelet will talk to any container runtime that is available where they are able to understand each other. And uh, based on that, when Kubelet gets a request saying, I want to create a pod, uh, Kubelet will talk to container runtime and say like, okay, I want to create a pod which has this container. I know you can start containers and create ones. Please do it. So in theory, and I might probably got some things wrong. Happy to for folks to correct me. This is how it works. And when the container is actually going to spun up as a process, that's when it will know which uh, seccom profile is listed in the container runtime. And then as the container gets started as a process, it inherits that profile and says, okay, I'm only allowed these calls and everything else I'm not allowed. So that's basically how the whole Kubernetes, Kubelet, Container Runtime, Seccom default things work. Uh, to your question about like whether it's consistent across runtimes, probably not. Uh, and uh, that is another thing to consider as, an op as somebody who manages clusters is if I'm gonna change uh, my Kubernetes uh, underlying infrastructure is my container runtime changing. And if it's changing, there is potentially unknown behavior that could happen in applications. And maybe once this call that you assumed was blocked is not blocked anymore. And then there is possible exploit that was not possible before, which is now possible. So lots, lots to think about, but for folks who are new, I just wanted to give some context so we can kind of go at the same level and go from there. Any any other thoughts, questions? Profile. Profile is container based or node based. Yeah, I think you you answered it right. So uh, if I remember right, you specify you pick the name of a policy uh, per node per per container in the pod spec but the actual JSON of the policy is typically installed on disk because it's part of the, the runtime configuration. So each node needs to have the configuration installed on it, which is one of the things you mentioned is you need to distribute this policy to all your nodes or are part of updates or part of node installation. But yes, at runtime, when you schedule your pods or deploy them, you need to, you need to pick from the, the list you've already installed, which is tricky. <laughs> create a profile which only control which syscall my container can access. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's, oh, there, there's a default policy by default, which it, usually there's a default policy by default, which most of them look close to what Docker started using a long time ago, even though you're not using Docker likely, uh, which allows a pretty broad, safe, supposedly, list of things that denies some definitely privileged things. But yes, you can write your own least privileged narrow policy if you'd like. Or add things back that are missing from the uh, Docker policy. Like, I think notably one I ran into personally was, um, I believe, I was trying to use user namespaces inside of a container, and uh, the Docker, the, the default second policies were disallowing it, and I had to add it. too much time <laughs> if this is the this is the case um, since our company use commercial runtime uh, monitoring we use uh, Palo Alto twist lock and uh, it's expensive um, we also go open source 
um, I, I have investigated FOCO, uh, uh, sponsored by SysDIC. It is open source. And uh, we also try to come up with the uh, second profile. I just do a very brief investigation and I found out it's because we are a cloud provider. Um, outage is, is, we have to pay customer if there is outage. It is impossible for us to train the container and generate the profile. So this, I come up with idea, I hope, um, you guys can give me an answer. Is that possible that the open source uh, sponsor can, can provide some sample profile from the container? For example, we, at the first beginning, we only want container not run in privileged mode, not uh, run in the host process ID, and not have um, privilege, escalation privilege. So if um, you guys can provide us profile which just prevent these options. We can first enforce um, this kind of control, and later we can add more and more on. Yeah, anyone want to take that? Okay, cool. Uh, I'll just summarize for everyone. Uh, there are different ways to control and isolate containers. Uh, not running as privileged, not allowing to escalate to privilege, uh, not running as with host network, host namespace, and stuff like that. Is there a way to control that and also then use seccomp as an additional control? So just in response to, to the, that comment, that's kind of where we um, where we are right now is <clears throat> where we have divested kind of the runtime control like seccomp, which actually does syscall intercept. We're investigating the use of Falco just to have observability so that we can at minimally enumerate any given application what it's actually calling. Um, and we can use Falco in conjunction with other terms to do kind of remediation after the fact should a malicious syscall come through. However, that doesn't offer you kind of the preventative control that some commercial carriers need in, in their instances. Um, but in development, that's a good strategy to have is to, again, use something like Falco to have observability first so that you enumerate out all of your given syscalls for an application. Second, start with <clears throat> your seccomp default profiles just to see if it breaks, uh, you know, uh, kills containers creates abnormal application behavior, and then slowly introduce policy on top of that. Actually, that's that's exactly what we had in mind uh, into in Cubescape, except we don't use Falco, we use uh, Inspector Gadget, but it's the same. Um, I, I was, uh, maybe first a question, and then I... Uh, um, I was actually just gonna mention Inspector Gadget. Um, so we're using that um, and I guess caveat, we haven't turned on the set comp feature yet. We're using it for network policies right now. Um, but the idea is that Inspector Gadget, it's open source on GitHub, um, and it runs as a daemon set everywhere, and then it will just silently collect like traces. And for us, it's connecting network traces. Um, and then at any given moment, you can just ask it like, hey, you know, I want you to generate me a network policy, um, you know, for like this long ago, or just based on whatever trace you see for these different labels. Um, and it will do that for you. It will make you like a Kubernetes network policy that you can then just take and do QCL apply or whatever. Um, and so it has a mode for that for setcomp. Um, and I guess part of why I'm here is to have, uh, learn what would happen if I went and turned that on. Um, like what would break or what might I expect from there. Um, but yeah, you can maybe use that or we're going to try to use that um, so to have silently tracing like what is any of these containers doing. And then in, in the future, we can go in there and look and say, okay, that one was doing this, that was doing that generate me a second profile to, to take with me and then I can either like add or modify or take away or whatever. I think that's like, uh, like profiling is a very powerful feature of course, but I think um, the biggest issue is just like 99% of the time, ideally, like your application is running well, it's running as expected, nothing weird's going on. But like that 1% of the time where you have errors or you have like weird paths being taken is super important. And, and if you have, um, you know, like you turn on seccomp based on some profile you did for a month of like, you know, a good performing application, all of a sudden it gets an error and then it can't like, you know, do any error remediation, logging, whatever you want to do there. 
like that would be a, a very serious issue. So you'd have to be like very certain that you've tested like thoroughly before you can like be confident in that profile. And I think that lack of confidence is one of the big things that like slows down at um, slows down adoption of SecComp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you have to choose either be resilient or be secure. One of the things to consider too is the ability of your application to auto scale or for error recovery. The more resilient your application is, the more you can, the more enforcement you can have in your set comp policy. However, if your application isn't resilient, if it's kind of more in the pets versus the cow, then you know you should really be have a very uh, a very light set comp policy. I also had one question from developer experience perspective. When I've seen SecComp blocking something for my application, I get a very unuseful error, something like operation not permitted or even worse. And as a developer, it can be hard to know like, okay, is this something I did in my application? Is this something in the cluster? Is it the runtime that's giving me problem? Any ideas from people working on this and using it in terms of how to help developers know this is not you, this is cluster managers, or you need to go to talk to Kubernetes admins. Any ideas or experiences? Okay, Andy has one. Cheers. Uh, it's a bit of a complex problem because the point of SecComp is to block those syscalls in the kernel so passing information back into user space is potentially, or was considered originally, potentially leaking data. Um, there is something from Christian Browner, who's one of the canonical guys who's done a lot of work around this, called the SecComp Notifier. So it's a way of kind of getting an out-of-band actual response back from the, um, what might even be a seg fault sometimes for, uh, for the kernel. Um, but yeah, it's kind of intentionally opaque, and it's really not a very nice feature for a user. Um, yeah, sorry, that's not a very <laughs> productive answer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fair in some ways, like there is a good rationale for both. Uh, so that makes sense. Any thoughts, anything else anyone wants to share? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, I wanted to say there are also other ways of blocking syscalls. Like if, if you take the, the approach that Google had when they started the uh, Gvisor, for instance, they, they intercept syscalls not at the kernel level, but at between user land and kernel land. I don't know if it's more uh, effective. It, it definitely has an impact on performance, but uh, yeah. I don't know if anyone is using other solutions to block syscalls. So that was my question. I've yet to put any of those in prod, but yeah, the other thing I'd compare Gvisor to is actually just using a VM-based solution, which is sometimes quite difficult in cloud with uh, some of them r r disabling nested hypervisors. But um, yeah, Kata containers in many ways, I would actually compare to Gvisor more than anything else. And there are different trade-offs. Yeah, my understanding is Gvisor has overhead for sure, but it is lower fixed overhead. Mm -hmm. So if like, you, like, it doesn't require tons of memory and things. Like everything's a little bit slower, but it doesn't have tons of overhead, whereas a VM has a moderate fixed overhead, but it's actually quite efficient once it's running. So, as opposed to SecComp, which is mostly free because it's already in the kernel, but it has limitations. Uh, actually, since the Gvisor was mentioned, I'm curious, uh, from the monitoring and tracing standpoint, for example, if you're using eBPF for like stack tracing, and Gvisor intercepts the call, what actually you will see through the entire stack, what will be in the eBPF, because Gvisor is essentially fakes the call and fakes the interception. On both level, it's in user space, in this kernel space, as far as I understand. So I'm, I'm just curious if anybody tried to run eBPF along with Gvisor or any other tracer of the syscalls, and how the entire stack will look like. I haven't performed that specific test, but I, my understanding is is that 
the emulation of those syscalls is actually done with a really small subset of total syscalls. Well, that, that's the set that they emulate, but I think there's, um, there, there's a diagram that I can't, it's on their website somewhere. It's probably also worth saying that um, Google are rolling back Gvisor because they, they had it around uh, Cloud Run because Cloud Run was originally running on Borg and they were like, well, C is not safe enough to expose to users. The Linux kernel is not sufficient for our use, um, which is why they rewrote it. But then they've been just weird edge cases. And uh, certainly the, I think Cloud Run V3 is the latest incarnation that they're doing. It just doesn't use Gvisor. So the, that on the one hand, but the other is there's a triangle graphic on, on their website somewhere which shows the number of syscalls they support and then the, the ones they actually go down to from uh, an actual system call level. And it's not very many. So I, I think you'd see very confusing traces because they wouldn't map. Um, yeah, again, immediately helpful answer, but perhaps not. We got about a couple of minutes more. Uh, I kind of want to end it on a non second note. So to you answer your question, right? Seccomp is one of the many ways we can continue to isolate containers and pods in our cluster. I think three of the things that you mentioned are already good ones that we can continue to use. So I think that is always important to consider in perspective. Like, yes, definitely use Seccomp. It's helpful. It does a lot, uh, but there is, uh, uh, f to your question, like, have you uh, played around with the recent pod security standards that were made part of the cluster before? Uh, I think in 125 and plus. Yeah, so that would be something of something what you are looking for, where it has three uh, built-in standards in as part of the cluster that do all the three things that you mentioned, uh, and then and some more, and uh, they're based on different granularities. There is a seccom field also to do the things that we all discuss. Uh, and that is something easy to kind of do on your laptop and just see if your application works. Uh, it starts with privileged baseline and restricted. I think baseline is a decent start with enough, good enough, depending on your risk posture. Uh, so that's where I would say like we can end like, yes, seccom is great. We should continue to explore and push the boundaries to make it better. and in some future world, when you give a YAML of a pod, it automatically generates a seccom profile for all of us, and that would be wonderful, but we are not there yet. So with that, 